Alrighty, so good morning to all of you watching me by way of Facebook. <coughs> Today I thought I should do a video. You know, I've been running a number of um, scriptures. I post scriptures every day. <coughs> and these scriptures are seemingly very provocative. So are my write-ups that I do from time to time. And one of the most amazing things that has happened on my page recently, and of course I attribute this to God and to the algorithms, especially the algorithms, you, you don't know what these algorithms do, but one thing that's for sure is it has given me a very strange, interesting audience. I have an amazingly strange audience. I mean, I know there are probably others who are in my boat as well, but I, whenever I post stuff on my wall, uh, my wall attracts a lot of thinkers. I have a lot of uh, people who are skeptics, like myself. There's a lot of people that are atheists. And, and woo, the atheists are such a um, uh, bitter lot. There's a lot of bitterness, scathing attacks, mockers. Oh, oops, there's no sound. That's very strange. Okay, confirm to me if you can hear me or not hear me. Anybody else who's not hearing any sound, please indicate. Uh, but um, I'm aware that all the settings are in order, so sound should be there. But just anybody else who, who's not hearing any sound, please confirm. So I'm waiting for your comments just to confirm if you can see, oh, I mean, hear sound from my, uh, from my speaking to you right now. But anyway, like I was saying, <clears throat> I'm waiting for you to confirm, so please type and just confirm uh, if you can hear a sound. If not, then I'll have to restart this. So just confirm, please. Somebody type real quick and let me know if you can hear sound. So Steven Sakala says there's no... Oh, great. Salifianji, thank you. And everybody else, thank you. So sound is there. Oh, great. Banda Allison, uh, Solomon Piri, awesome stuff. Okay. So, I have a very interesting uh, plethora of people. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody, Greyford. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being on. Mash Ndawa, awesome. Nzelo Navi Banda, uh, Chico, awesome. Thank you, guys. All right, so let's go on. So, I'll be real quick with this. It's in the morning, so I need to be as quick as possible. So, like I was saying, I have a very interesting uh, lot that actually follow my page. And uh, I have skeptics, I have atheists, I have agnostics, I have pan-Africanists who don't believe in anything to do with the white man's religion as they call it, which it isn't, but anyway. So I have a very interesting uh, mix of people. And one of the things that has predominantly occurred on my page is people asking whether the Bible is authentic. And uh, it's been a pervasive question. Now, for me, who is a theologian, and when you take into account my background, I mean, before I got saved, I was deep in the occult. I'm not even kidding. Deep in the occult. Uh, Gnosticism and palmistry, astrology, uh, and a lot of things. Uh, and I went into the occult. So I actually went into a form of astral travel and uh, transcendental meditation. I did a lot of that. So when I got saved, God took a man... That was a skeptic through and through. At the time, I didn't understand I'm a skeptic. And then transformed me by the power of his word. He also supernaturally did a new work in me. So I had a very powerful supernatural experience. And so being a skeptic, thank God that by his, uh, his grace, he placed me in the hands providentially. He placed me in the hands of a man who, who is a theologian. And a log what I call uh, a scholarly theologian. And you know, God is amazing. He knows our types of persons we are. And so he put me in those hands so that with that kind of background, I am helped. Because I had a lot of questions. I did not doubt I had an encounter with Yahweh. I had no doubt about that. I had no doubt that I met Yah, so Yeshua, Jesus. I had no doubt about that. The issue was... Is his word genuine? Is the Bible genuine? Is it, what about all these things we see around us, which can't be ignored? The seeming recurrence of extraterrestrial uh, appearances. Now, even mainstream media no longer says UFOs are the preserve of, um, of conspiracy theory. They have now confirmed highest levels of uh, intelligence agencies, such as the CIA, have actually come out and said, yes, we 
are aware of aerial phenomenon. They've even given it a new name now, so they're not calling them UFOs anymore. They're not called unidentified flying objects. They've now given them a new name, which I've just forgotten right now, but it's something called unidentified aerial phenomenon or something like that. I don't know, but they've changed the name. And so the big question now is, if these things are recurring, what then is happening? It draws me to the words of Jesus. Jesus said in his, um, in his discourse around the end times, he said something very strange. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in these last days. Why would Jesus pick Noah's days? You know, you, you have so many other days. You could have said as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. He could have said as it was in the days of Tyre and Sidon. He could have picked any other era from the Old Testament and antiquity. No, he had to pick Noah's days. And you see, Noah's days are the strangest days in the Old Testament. In fact, in the book of Genesis, very strange passage, Genesis 6. And in those days, the sons of God... Benai Elohim saw the daughters of men, and what did they do? And they took some of them and made them wives. And then the Bible says, and to them the offspring that were born were giants, those warriors and and people of old men of renown. And then another very strange passage, and after that, so which, so so the Bible doesn't really go further in explaining that. Although I can infer a lot of scripture, but my topic today is on specifically on the issue of, um, I just lost power here. So let me switch off my computer. Uh, power has just gone. All right. So the lighting will go off a bit, but it's fine. Okay. We don't look so bad. Apologies. I just had to switch off my computer because power has just gone. So like I was saying, it was a very strange scenario when it comes to understanding what was going on in scripture. And the scriptures then remain very silent. But what's interesting is there's a book out there called the Book of Enoch. And the Book of Enoch goes into very interesting territory. I mean, that book is divided into five books. I've read it thoroughly. I read it. I study it. But my topic today is very simple. Why is the book of Enoch not part of the Bible? So that's my topic. So I'm not going to go into what the book of Enoch says, what strange territory it, it covers. That's going to be a topic for another day because this will make this talk too long. I'll, I'll keep it to why is the book of Enoch not in scripture? And what's even more interesting is that not only is the book of Enoch not in scripture, but three apostles quote it. Three apostles. So we have uh, Paul, who refers to it in places. We have Peter, who refers to it in places. And we have the book of Jude, which refers to it. So why is it not there? So let's, let's, let's go deep into that. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you what for me is a very solid answer to why they are not part of scripture. So let me first be, uh, dispel some myths around this. You see, a lot of people say, well, you know, the book of Enoch is not quoted because it, it goes against, I've just seen somebody comment that there. I can't just read properly because the, the comments are going too fast. So I've heard somebody say, oh, we don't follow it because it, it, dis, it, it goes against Christian doctrine. And you know, in 300 AD, uh, what's that man's name? Constantine put together Christianity as we know it. And you know, that's, that's, so lame. I mean, anybody who's just who does just mundane history will tell you that that's such a nonsensical answer. Here's the reason why. Christianity predates uh, Constantine. That's what you've got to understand. In fact, the Bible teaches us that the, 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 the believers were first, first called Christians in Antioch. That's chapter 18 of Acts. So that's where they became called Christians. And the term was actually a derogatory term. Uh, to use to kind of make fun of them. The, the, before that, they were called the people of the way. Of course, that could prob probably come from the fact that Jesus said in, in, in John 14 that I am the way, the truth, and the life. So obviously the way was this cultural belief and op operation that was uniquely Christian. You must understand also that Christianity was extremely countercultural, extremely 
counter-cultural, meaning it opposed everything about the day. There was massive idolatry going on. These were Romans. They worshipped Roman deities, specifically Jupiter or Zeus, if, whichever you want to call them. So Zeus was Greek. Jupiter was Roman. Roman, But they were one and the same person. They were this god that they all worshipped. They had powerful uh, places where they put up altars to worship this god. And so when Christians came, what's the first thing they said? You shall have no idols. So immediately Christians were counter-cultural and they were opposed with the full might of the Roman Empire. And for 200 years, that's what happened. Christians were put to death in all manner of ways because of their position. So this is a, a, a historical fact. We, we must not run away from that. So Christianity predates Constantine. So Constantine gets saved and yeah, we have a great revelation of Constantine. And so God then decides to use Constantine. That's my total belief that he was used by God to put together these books that had been around for about a couple of centuries and they were scattered. But they were known and respected, these books. A lot of scholars actually quoted these books. The early um, church fathers quoted these books. So it was already known and it was already standard that all the writings of the apostles, people that walked and interacted with Jesus in person, all their writings became sacred. So this was already something that happened within the early formation of Christianity. Paul came and did heavy duty uh, expounding of Christian doctrine and then church fathers came and built on that, Irenaeus and all these early church fathers from the 1st century AD, 2nd century AD until we got into the 3rd century AD when around, so in the 4th century AD that's when Constantine has his incident and after that we then saw the actual inception of putting together what became the book or the Bible. Now, when that happened, this is where I want to just go in a little deeper so that you understand. When that happened, something interesting began to occur. When Constantine became a Christian, there was an entire cottage industry of religious people that were making a killing out of pagan religion. Okay, so these were your blacksmiths, these were your priests and priestesses. You had your your uh, entire industry around the searching for God in their circles. So these guys found themselves disenfranchised and the great war become, began internally to try and find ways to kind of restore back these people. So in that process, we see 30 to 40 years later, the emergence of what was the fused power of the Caesar. So the Caesar and the bishop became one and became known as the papacy. And that was now the establishment of the most powerful movement in the history of Christendom. The sad part is that indeed Lucifer had penetrated through the church. And so the papacy, historical, this is historically true. I'm not making this up. The papacy became the most powerful oppressor of Christian truth. Now, what is interesting is that as they put these books together, there were certain standards by which they operated to determine authenticity of scripture. The challenge you face with the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, in fact, basically all their apocryphal books, the problem you face with them, including the Book of Enoch, is that as scholars continue to work out what is and isn't scripture, what is canon and what isn't canon, they began to use a certain standard. And I'm going to just focus on one of those standards. There are many. There are about five or six. It is a very powerful standard. In fact, the standard is so high that these books basically fall apart. And here's where we go now. So let's begin. So what was the standard that was used? Number one. The scriptures as we know them were copied by scribes, okay? So scribes had a way of writing scripture. They were so meticulous in their writing of scripture that that standard was discernible by any serious student of grapha bibliosis or, or graphical study, written study of the Bible, okay? So we're not talking about just 
study mundane study or theology. No, we're talking about the actual writing of the Bible. These guys were so meticulous that if he copied a scroll and one extra letter was missing, they just ripped that whole thing and started again. So the standard was so high that there is no other book in antiquity that even comes close in comparison to the level of meticulousness that scribes and uh, ancient teachers put into copying the word of God. Okay? So this is the first thing you have to understand. So the style of writing, the flow of language, the originality of concept, all these things were counted and studied. And so it was easy for scholars of Grapha to see the misalignment. So let me give you some very good examples of misalignment in scripture. For example, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to 2 verse 3. And Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 to Genesis chapter 2, whatever, the end of, of Genesis 2. These two books, any serious scholar of scripture can see the difference in flow. It has become the most discussed and conundrum filled passage in the Old Testament because any serious scholar in the Hebrew and in the Greek Masoretic text could see the difference between the two. And so the only reason it survives to this day is because right from the Talmud, right from the Torah, this book has been as it has been. So it has not been altered. And so because of that, it survived. But then books like the book of Enoch, now let's go into that, have a challenge. It existed in first century AD. This is just when the church was born. But it had a lot of additions. So scholars who studied the graphic writings of the earliest known manuscripts, and by the way, the, the, the manuscripts for Christianity and for, for the Bible are insane mad close to the source. They are so close to the source, there is no other book in antiquity that even comes close. I mean, comparing the Bible to the next most quoted and respected work outside religious circles, which is the Homer, Homer's Iliad, by the way, Homer's Iliad, when you compare the two, it's like comparing a bicycle and a jet. And I'm not joking. It's like comparing a bicycle and a jet. Because the closest known existing manuscript in the Iliad is a thousand years apart. Between the earliest known existing manuscripts and the original source at which the time was written. The Bible has books and sources that are 100 years, 50 years from source. I mean, that's mad crazy. Nothing in antiquity comes close. That alone sets the Bible apart. It's not an ordinary book by any standards. But let's go back to Enoch. So scholars study and they use these meticulous standards to determine if this is close to source and original. And what do they discover? They discover discrepancies. They discover that the book of Enoch as found in the Coptic, Ethiopian Coptic Bible, the book of Enoch as found in the early code, code, they call it code, but it's actually codex, which is the written code, the written words as put down by scribes. When they compare, they see the discrepancies. And when it comes to the word of God, if you're going to say this is God's word, this is the words that God wrote. If we're going to say that, we cannot have two discrepant sources and we call that the word of God. The Bible is so accurate that that could not be allowed. And let me show you the standard. Because you see, when we hit the 18th century, you know, basically from the 16th century at the rise of the Reformation. And of course, more importantly, the Renaissance in, uh, you know, European Renaissance, when basically printing press began, knowledge began to spread everywhere. When that happened, something profound happened. The... The people, the, the age of enlightenment came and many people began to question the Bible. And I can't quote sources, my brother. I'm speaking off my head. To quote sources, I have to have a PowerPoint. Somebody's just saying, quote sources. I have to have a PowerPoint. This is not a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just telling you what I know. 
but you can go check up everything I'm saying and it backs up. So back to my point. So here you have uh, these individuals and they are beginning to question the Bible. They are beginning to question everything about God. And by the end of the 19th century, there was so much fire on the authenticity of scripture. You see, there were many who were wondering if there's any truth to scripture. So here's something interesting that happened. In 1948, as far as I'm concerned, the find of the century was the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Turns out God in his providence raised, uh, there was an order in the time of Jesus. In fact, just before the time of Jesus, into the time of Jesus, after the Maccabean revolt and after Jews come under the subjection of the Romans, that whole period, uh, 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 what's his name? Antonius Epiphanes and his horrible deed that he did at the temple, that period, an order was born. That order was called the Essenes. Now these Essenes ran and took all scripture from the temple and from all places that are holy and they carried them and they went and hid them in the caves in the Dead Sea. And so they began to operate from that place and it's amazing that as they operated from that place, they kept these scriptures meticulously hidden. And so, as God would have it, they remained hidden for 1,950 years or thereabout. And so, in 1948, a young shepherd boy is running around, and what do they see? Boom! They find these scrolls, and they're excited. And they start to play around. But then as they're messing around with those scrolls, they say, oh, these things must be important. And so they go tell others and very quickly a whole, the whole world descends at that place. They had found all the original stuff coming from the time of Jesus, including scrolls. And as they began to open those scrolls, they found portions of scripture. They found Isaiah, they found Jeremiah, they found, found the Psalms, they found, they found so much. It was the trove of the century. And so this stuff was taken and meticulous process began to put all these bits and pieces together. And you are, are going to be amazed because after they finished putting this stuff together, guess what? The, they found the entire book of Isaiah. Now remember, this is a writing that was dated to first century AD, literally the time Jesus was born. And it is found 1,950 years ago. And when they do a comparison, the earliest known written records we had as Christians and as the church dated to the two greatest uh, sources from which we source our Bible. The first is Codex Sinaiticus, which is the first completed writing of scripture from maybe 600 AD, somewhere there. And Codex Vaticanus, which came on a little later. And then it's from these two Codi that they took out the Latin Bible. It's from the Latin Bible and the two Codi that they got the early compilations of the Bible, which were in Latin. And then the first known English work, which was begun by the great man William Tyndale in the 15th century. Sorry, 14th, 16th century, which is 15, you know, 1500. He was bent at the stake for it. Very sad. But then in 1611, when King James decided to, you know, commission an English Bible, they quoted heavily from this guy, okay? So, when you add all that together, you see that the Cody and the early found books were literally identical, only off by one yacht and one tittle. You know, if you study the book of Isaiah, it should have not less than a thousand characters. And of the thousand characters, over 1,950 years, and you only find two. I mean, if we did it in English, like a period and a full stop, that is a 99.999999% accuracy. It's unreal. It's, un it's, it's, it's so powerful. Okay, so this is the level of accuracy involved. So back to the book of Enoch. So when Enoch was studied, unfortunately, in spite of the many answers that book has to the mysteries we see today, it could not be canon because of its glaring additions. 
So a number of additions were brought into the book of Enoch. Some, some are traced to the 1st century AD, some are traced to about the 7th, 8th century AD, and some are traced to the 13th century AD. So as early as the 13th century, some of the monks in some of these places were adding stuff to that book. And so when that happens, just like the book of Thomas, you know, they talk about the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Those books were written in the 13th century. Actually, all antiquity traces them to the 13th century. So they don't come from Jesus' time. They were never written by uh, either Magdalene or Philip or Thomas. No, they were written by people from 13th century A.D. And you see, that's why it's so important that we understand purely how these books came about and must be careful to only work with the original. Now, God in his wisdom raised very powerful scholars and the job of those scholars has been to authenticate the source. And that's why we can trust in what is there today. Take it from me. I'm going to say this again. I am a skeptic by nature. I have done serious research on this. Because when I heard about these books, I had to go and look at them and I worked on them. They were not taken out in 300 AD. I see somebody 300. No, they were not taken out in 300 AD. Those books existed all the way through to the 13th century, 14th century. And that's why there's been so much revisionist work. Let me tell you something about, since you raised 300 AD, let me tell you something about the papacy. And again, as I speak about the papacy, uh, apologies to my wonderful friends in the, in, the, in, the, in the Roman Catholic Church. But this is all history. What I'm about to share with you is history. The papacy and the established church from essentially 4th century AD wanted to keep the word of God secret. Okay, so it's not just a case of the books that were taken out. No, the whole Bible was never accessible to ordinary people. This is what you must understand. And because the whole Bible was accessible, was not accessible to everyone, they only had to listen to what you know, preachers and pastors said in front. So the church used this. Evil men who infiltrated the church used this as a means to control common people. And they did that for almost a thousand years. That's why they are called the Dark Ages. Why are they called the Dark Ages? Because everything, including the light of God, was hidden. Thankfully, by his grace, God always had a remnant preserved throughout history. And some of these remnants rose. For example, the R.B. Genesis were a powerful sect of people that rose up and they were the custodians of the true word of God. They knew how to read. They had one or two copies of scripture. Those days, it had to be meticulously written by hand. Please don't forget that. So it was very challenging for them. And if the church found you, listen to me, if the church found you in possession of a Bible, you were put to death. So you have to understand that the church was hiding the entire Bible. It wasn't just these books or those books. You see, it's because we have so much access to the Bible today, so we think it's always been like this. No, it hasn't. The, the, when, when the printing press came about, one of the greatest challenges great men and women of God had against the church was to allow the Bible to be printed. There was massive dispute against it. They said, no, you can't print the, the word of God because it must remain sacred. So there was this, this tendency to kind of worship the book itself, something you see in a number of other religions where the, the, the holy book is kept. You know, those are just words. That's just a book. The, the, the power is in the people who speak and, and listen and believe. So this... The church wanted to stop that. So the Albigenses are an example of people who rose up and preserved the truth and the papacy sent the full might of its army. You, know, you must not forget that the church had a very powerful army. They were called knights. So these knights were sent to go and destroy that entire community. They massacred everybody. That's the Albigenses. They're not the only ones. There was the Valdenses of Germany. That's another group that got hold of the true scriptures and began to teach the truth in scripture. 
the greatest teaching of which was the just shall live by faith, that there is nothing like working for salvation. It is receiving Jesus by faith. It is a grace given freely. That's what they didn't want people to learn. Okay, and so that meant again the purpose has sent its full force of power upon the Valdenses and massacred them. Another example are the Hagonauts. I'm telling you stuff that's historically true. I'm not making this stuff up, eh? Go check your history. So the, 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 the Hagonauts are another group in France. The church sent its full might and power. 30,000 people were massacred in three days at the behest of the church with the full blessing of the papacy. Know your history. Okay? So the, the church has consistently, and I'm talking about the church as in the mother church, has consistently fought for the knowledge of scripture. This is why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. When he shines his light, darkness cannot comprehend the light. That's why Jesus fought through his people to ensure the word came out to mankind. So you see, when the, 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 the mother church and the papacy and all these evil people failed to stop that, what did they do next? Next they did was to try and now discredit the source by teaching heresy. So you have to understand that in the 15th and the 16th century, God brought the light of the word. The protestant movement was born and that's how we have seen this massive sharing of God's word. So the only strategy the enemy is doing today now is to plant tears in the truth. So he has gone into the church, he did that a long time ago, but he's infiltrated every denomination. I am here to tell you there is no denomination that is safe from the influence of the powers of darkness. So they have infiltrated everywhere and they're throwing so much seeds of destruction and danger out there that the average person has no idea what is the truth. So let me say this in closing. The book of Enoch, the book of Thomas, the book of Philip, the book of Mary Magdalene, Judith, Ju 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 Judith the book of, Ju I can't remember, the book of Tobit, Syriac, Ecclesiasticus, all these which are known as the Apocrypha, those books have been changed and so therefore we cannot trust them as being the authentic word of God. They fall short on so many places. But for the average person, they don't understand. And this is why I told somebody the other day that even as you study these apocryphal books, by the way, don't think I just speak. I have the African Bible here, which is actually the, the Duoi, the Catholic Duoi version. I have all these Bibles. I study them. I read them. But I can never take books like the book of Enoch as the canon of scripture. I cannot take the book of Enoch at the same level as I would take, for example, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, I am beyond doubt certain that that was dictated by Jesus and it has been preserved and it really is his scriptures. It is his word spoken. But then Enoch may or may not be his word. There is so much in there that brings it under serious uh, failure when scrutinized using the standards that were used for the canon we call the closed canon of scripture. The closed canon of scripture are the 66 books. And that, that I can tell you, take it from me, I can tell you and I can guarantee you that, my friend, meets every standard imaginable. Let me tell you, if this Bible was not as genuine as it is, the enemy has been seeking for the last 2,000 ways, for years rather, for means to discredit it, it would have fallen apart. If this Bible was not, I wish I had a Bible with me here, if this Bible was not the genuine word of God, the enemy would have poked holes in it and finished it and destroyed it. You know why he can't destroy it? It is the living, breathing manifestation of Yeshua. It is God in the word. Those words have power. 
Those words have transformed nations. Those words have transformed families. Those words have transformed wretched sinners like myself, taken me from darkness into light. They are not just mere words, my friend. That's why when I post uh, these things, these scriptures, they cause so much. Go on my wall and see. I, I just post the words of Jesus. I don't even say anything. Look at the comments that come from there. Look at the anger and the bitterness that comes from just posting the word of God. Because it is power. The Bible says the word of God is sharper than any, any two-edged sword. Able to do what? To cut. <laughs> cut to the divining of bone and marrow and soul and spirit. And here's the best part. And is a discerner of the intents of the heart. No other word cuts like the word of God. No wonder Jesus said, and when that stone is full, it will fill up the whole earth. And anyone who falls on that stone, they shall be broken. And anyone on whom the stone falls, they shall be crushed. One way or another, the word of God transforms. It's not mere words. But when we go into books like the book of Enoch, I would say the book of Enoch is like Josephus of antiquity. Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, wrote very powerful historical truth which can be verified with archaeology. And it makes for deep information we need to make sense of some of the things we see. But you cannot equate Josephus, you cannot equate Enoch as being the word of God. So here's my closing remarks to help those of you that are in this space. Somebody asked me, can you give examples? That's a whole study. I, I can't do that here. That's a book. There are books that show you clearly where the discrepancies are in the books, in these books that are out there. That's why they're not part of canon. Okay? So... Let's go back to my closing remarks. So when you study books like the book of Enoch, especially the book of Enoch, study it as a historic account that exists today to fill up gaps that are difficult to fill in using just scripture. And I'll be going a lot into that. I'll be discussing the end time deception. I'll be discussing what's going on in the world. Why is there so much child abduction? Why is there all this child sex trade, uh, you know, sexual rich, uh, satanic ritual abuse? Why is there, what's CERN doing? What's the master reset, the great master reset? What, what are these things going on? How do they tie in one world religion, one world government, one world system? What are these? New world order. What's that? And who is really the God of this age? Who is the God of this age? Who are the proxies for the God of this age? So those are topics that you will be amazed. that when you go into the book of Enoch, it gives a very powerful scenario of what went on in Genesis 6 and Genesis 11. So you get a very good picture because it goes into filling in a lot of blanks. But I will never take the book of Enoch as scripture. I will never take the book of Enoch as the undisputedly accurate word of God. No, because I've studied it and I know where it falls short. So we have to understand the differences. But to those of you that are studying that book, it's a great book. For me, some of the Gospels, stay away from them. They are very dangerous. The book of Magdalene is, 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 is a book that I believe was planted by evil people to push the, what we call, Holy Grail and, yeah, the Holy Grail agenda. Those of you who've read or followed Angels and Demons and the stuff of, uh, uh, if you follow the Da Vinci Code, the writer of Da Vinci Code got his story directly from a book that was written some 15, 20, sorry, 30, 40 years ago called The Holy Grail and the Holy Blood. And that book gave insight into some serious, serious conspiracies going around the church. And it is from there where he drew that story, which became very popular. But I can tell you with certainty that even with sources like that, there is a lot of things that you ought to be very careful about because we live in an era of great deception. So be aware 
that there is great deception and same 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 uh, uh, story that book you just mentioned there mega enoch mutondo can mention it that book also is also part of these great deceptions of the last days a lot of these things will come to bring deception jesus said that the fields were planted with wheat and in the night the enemy came and planted tares and when they woke up in the morning they found tares had been planted with wheat and they could not tell the difference. And Jesus said, let them all grow together. In the end of time, the real genuine wheat shall be harvested, but the rest shall show because it will show its true character. I believe God in his wisdom has permitted so many of these things to come out because let's be honest, guys. There's a process of seeking God. God wants to be sought. And only those who seek and lean on him genuinely shall see his salvation. So that's the story about the book of Enoch. It is a book of, to be taken as history and leave it at that. But don't take it as gospel. And the reason it was eliminated is because it just doesn't stand the test. So that, so conspiracy theorists who want to tell you, no, they removed it because there's truth. What truth? The truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. He even said himself, John 14, 6, I am the way the truth and the life none come to the father except by me he said it which other truth are you looking for what people are looking for is esoteric truth esoteric truth is deception people look for esoteric truth because they look for power and when you're looking for power my friend that's the beginning of your downfall and the enemy knows that human beings in their carnality are moved by power. They are seduced by power. Okay? So because they are seduced by power, they seek to find power. And when, when the enemy comes and lies to them and says, when you know these things, you'll have power, they go for that. Because yes, they do get power. And people want power. That's the bottom line. Man has always been drawn away from God through their things. The love of money, the love of power, the love of carnal lusts. That's it. So lusts of a sexual nature, lust for fame, and lust for fortune. And the devil knows how to get those three things locked in, my friend. And he does it well. So... I've told you guys, so there you have it for today. I hope you've had a wonderful time. Share this video widely. I, I mean, I, I, I'll write these things as we go. I will share a lot, especially about how we got our Bible. It's an amazing story. Just know this. Every force of hell fought to, to put down God's word. Don't think this Bible we have today came free. People died. Nations died. Apostles died. So many died so that we have our Bible today. But God preserves and watches over his word to accomplish that which it says. My friend, when you go against God's word, you go against God. And there is no God on this realm, no God that is greater than our God. You be blessed.